Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. Hello everyone, it's Spawnpoint and this is my full review of the PSVR 2, PlayStation's VR headset for the PS5. So I've been using it over the last week playing games like Horizon Call of the Mountain and Gran Turismo 7 which have looked incredible on this. But I wanted to cover what I like, dislike and most importantly if it's really worth buying. Today I'll talk about using it for gaming, watching movies, the motion handling, picture quality and comfort, as well as some great features like the cinematic mode, and that lets you watch and play content that isn't designed for VR on a massive virtual screen. So I hope this review is helpful today and it answers some questions that you might have had, but if I have missed any just drop those below and I will try to get back to you. Now last week I did a full unboxing on the channel along with the entire setup process, but in summary it comes with the headset, two controllers, some stereo earbuds and a USB-C charging cable. As for the setup process it's really straightforward, PlayStation have done a great job of making it as effortless as possible. You just need to plug the USB cable into the front of the PS5, run through the on-screen prompts and within a matter of minutes the headset is up and running. But if you want to see the full setup process and the unboxing I'll have linked to that video below. So let's talk about the picture quality on this. Inside we get two OLED displays that support 4K HDR, which means everything that we see in VR looks sharp and vibrant. I've tested a few different games out over the last week, and the one thing that I keep coming back to for that wow factor is Horizon Call of the Mountain. This game looks crazy clear, and I've been truly blown away by how nice the visuals are, including the brightness and the clarity as well. Now I'm using a capture card today to show you how these games look, which is in fact a lower resolution to what you see inside the headset, so it's one of those that you have to see it to believe it scenario, but the picture quality really is impressive. And like with any OLED display, there's no surprise that the black levels and the contrast are almost perfect. There's no blooming or washed out colours, and it's still bright enough that you probably won't run this at 100% brightness. And as the seal around the headset is tight, there's no light leaking through and distracting you. Then there's the field of view of 110 degrees. It makes playing the games feel immersive and does a great job of wrapping the content around your head, both vertically and horizontally. You do notice a little bit of darkness in your peripheral vision, but that's only if you go looking for it, and generally speaking you do forget about it once you're playing. When it comes to motion handling and the frame rate, you'll be pleased to know that it offers up to 120Hz. This means any game that supports this will be silky smooth, and I've not experienced any screen tearing or stuttering no matter how fast I move around. And that leads me on to motion sickness and how it can affect you while gaming. For me it's had zero impact, I can sit or stand, move around or stand still. It might sometimes feel a little trippy as you're looking over the edge of a cliff, but I definitely have not suffered from any motion sickness while playing. However, my wife has tried it a few times, and she has experienced it almost immediately after putting it on. Now, sitting down will vastly reduce it though, where you don't need to worry about trying to stand up straight as you're moving your character around, but it obviously affects everybody differently. If you are concerned about motion sickness, my advice would be to try one out before buying. Now, any VR headset will do, so you could try a MetaQuest for example, and it's a good idea just to make sure you're not wasting your money on something that you cannot physically use. Now when it does come to physically using it, you might be concerned of how much space you need around you. Well PlayStation recommends having a safe area of 2 meters by 2 meters, and as it comes with a 4.5 meter cable that should be no problem for most rooms, but you can either use it sitting or standing, so you don't need a massive room to run around in, just enough to wave your arms. And when you set it up for the first time, you'll be prompted to map out your room. This will take a blueprint of your room and it works out where the safe areas are that you can walk to while you're gaming. You can then go ahead and edit this safe area by using the controllers to either add or remove sections of your room, so maybe the corner of a desk or a coffee table that it might have failed to pick up. Now every game that I've tested, I don't tend to walk around too much, so as long as you have a couple of feet around you, enough to spread your arms out at least, that should be fine. And if you're in the middle of a game and you are concerned about walking into something, all you need to do is tap the function button under the headset and it gives you an instant live feed of your room. This pass through camera is a brilliant idea and it means you can check your surroundings without needing to take the headset off and on each time. Then there's the option to sit down and play, so games like GT7 you're more likely to sit down rather than stand up while you're playing. This means space isn't an issue at all, as you're only moving your head around and not your arms or your body. You could do this with other games too, like the kayak game, in fact pretty much every game is suitable for sitting down if that's what you would prefer to do. So let's talk about games. These are all of the games that PlayStation have announced that are either new to VR2 or have had updates to make them compatible with VR. I think this is a pretty decent lineup. It's nowhere near as impressive as the back catalogue of games that we've got for the first gen, which unfortunately are not compatible with this one, but it's a really good start. 
At the moment, I only have five games in my library that are compatible with VR2, and these include Horizon Call of the Mountain, Gran Turismo 7, Moss Book 1 and 2, and Star Wars Tales from the Galaxy's Edge. Now, all of these games are completely different from one another in terms of the genre and what they offer, but they all have one thing in common. They look incredible on this headset. Horizon Call of the Mountain gives you that awesome first-person experience of walking around and exploring, climbing rocks, shooting arrows, and warming your hands next to the fire. And when you factor in the 3D audio, whether you're using the provided earbuds or your own headphones, this game feels incredibly immersive. Obviously, some of this is novelty, like eating an apple that you just picked up, or playing with a tambourine that you found on the bench. Maybe even smashing plates just because, well, you can but it still brings an awesome immersive experience that is hard to show you through this flat image. Then there's Moss Book 1 and 2, which are fun little games and probably one of the most popular games that we've seen on VR. So it's great to see that we've got an update for PSVR 2, as this will be a brilliant game for many first-time VR users to try out. But the game that got me the most excited about testing out, and one of the reasons I held off making this review in the first week, is Gran Turismo 7. So this game isn't new, I mean it's been out for nearly a year now, but the new VR update went live last week. And wow, it's hard to put into words how realistic and scary and fast this game feels when playing it in VR. Being able to look around the cabin while driving, looking over your shoulder or just seeing where the other cars are on the road, it feels strange yet kind of natural. I've always enjoyed GT7 but this brings a whole new level to racing. I think this is the game that I would recommend everyone trying out for this headset. They've even added a virtual showroom where you can move, walk and look around the cars in your garage, both inside and outside the car. Now there are other VR headsets out there which you can play most of these non-exclusive games on, but there's one thing that makes me want to play the VR 2 over say the MetaQuest 2, and that's the trophies. It might only seem like a small point, but if you're like me and you enjoy collecting trophies, I will always pick up the PS5 game over the MetaQuest game every single time. Plus with that 4K HDR, it will look better on this headset. So the VR2 doesn't come with speakers built in, but it does have a 3.5mm headphone jack on the back, as well as a pair of stereo earbuds included in the box. And once you've plugged these into the headset, you can wear the earbuds and you'll get that 3D audio sound without any extra cables. And you know what? These aren't bad at all. Now you can go ahead and wear your own headphones over the top of the headset if you would prefer, and I've tested out the Pulse 3Ds, the Nova Pros, and the InZone H9s, and they all fit over the VR headset with no issues. You can either use the 3.5mm headphone jack on the headset, or you can set the audio on your PS5 out to those headphones instead. Or you could use your TV or monitor speakers as well, but you're not going to get the full immersive experience doing it this way, although that is how I've been playing GT7 on my TV setup. So we've talked about how good these games look and sound, but how do they feel? Well, outside of turning your head to see where you want to go, you'll be controlling your gameplay with these two controllers. These are the Sense controllers. Essentially, they offer a similar experience to the DualSense controller, with the same buttons, thumbsticks and colour theme, but they've split them into two ergonomic handles instead. For me, these fit perfectly well in my hands and make controlling and playing the games effortless, whether I'm moving around, pointing at things, shooting or just trying to interact with the environment. I found these two really easy to use. They aren't heavy, the buttons are in an obvious and easy to reach spot and the added features make the gameplay even more immersive. We get things like adaptive triggers, so when pulling the L2 or R2 triggers, you will feel that slight resistance depending on the game or the action that you're doing. And we also get haptic feedback, so as you're moving around or picking things up, you get a slight rumble or vibration in the controllers, which change and respond to the situation. And something else, it has finger detection sensors built in, so even before you press the buttons, it will recognise if your fingers are resting on them, in turn changing the way that your hand is shown in the game. Another cool feature is if you place the controllers down on a desk, and you're not sure which is which, well the controllers will be labelled for you. As for the battery, I estimate I get around 4 to 5 hours out of them before needing a charge, which isn't great, but also 5 hours is enough time that I need a break anyway. In the box we have one USB-C cable to charge one controller, but then you do have another USB-C cable that came with the PS5, so in theory you should have two cables knocking around that you can use. Failing that, as it's a normal USB-C port, any cable will do the job. Or you could do as I've done and just buy the dual charging dock. This will not only make it easier to store them away, you also know that they're being charged every single time you put them down. And it looks pretty neat. I also tried charging these two controllers as I was playing, and to my surprise it worked. I'd seen others saying that you cannot charge the controllers while you play, but it definitely worked for me. Now you would need a pretty long USB cable just to ensure you don't get tangled up, at least in games like Horizon Call of the Mountain. 
but it's still great to know that you can technically use these controllers while you're charging. So we know VR games look great, but what about games and content that are not optimised for VR? How do they look and play? Well, fortunately, there's an option called Cinematic Mode, and what this does is create a virtual cinema screen inside your headset, and it allows you to view the content on a sort of static screen. You don't need to do anything special or fancy. Basically, any content that is not VR optimised will default to this view. So for example, the PS5's home screen is still a flat image. It doesn't wrap around your head while you're viewing it. You can then resize it by pressing the PlayStation button on the controller, and you get to see this menu. You can either have it as a small monitor or pretend you're sitting in the front row at the cinema. I've played a few different games this way, including Spider-Man and even Call of Duty, just to see how it works and how it plays. And you know what? Surprisingly, it works really well. It kind of feels like you're sitting in a dark room at the cinema with a massive projector screen. It's not as sharp as the full VR effect, but I would say it was slightly better than 1080p, and you obviously don't feel as immersed as you're watching a screen inside a screen. Now for those games that are not VR optimised, you can still use the DualSense controller just like you would before. Essentially, the PS5 is treating the VR headset like an external monitor or TV, so controls and gameplay feel exactly the same as normal. I did the same with movies and TV shows, and this is where I was really impressed. It literally felt like I was at the cinema. I can imagine a lot of people watching movies this way, as it gives the impression you've got a massive screen in your room. Although I would still choose to watch movies on my TV rather than this, it's still an incredibly impressive setup. Now, while you're using the headset, you can, if you wish, share your gameplay to your TV or monitor at the same time. This is useful if you've got other people in the room and you want to show them what you're seeing. Now, if you're using the advanced tracking option on the headset, it will reduce how much they see on the screen, as it adds a PlayStation border around the entire image. But if for any reason you would rather they see the entire screen instead, just disable this option and they get to see it all. And you can also live stream straight from the PS5 to YouTube or Twitch, in the same way as you can with any other game on the PS5. Just tap the share button on the Sense controller, hit broadcast, and you are now live on your streaming platform. As for comfort, well it's as comfortable as you need it to be. It's got a hard plastic frame on the outside, but on the inside it's coated with a nice soft flexible rubber. This moulds around your face quite nicely, but it also means it can get quite grubby, especially if you've got multiple people using it. And when it comes to wearing it, you simply pull it open, slide it over your head and twist the dial on the back to tighten it. There's also a button on the front which allows you to adjust the distance of the screen from your eyes, and this is ideal if you wear glasses. And finally, you can tweak the width of the lenses by spinning this dial. And you keep spinning this until everything is in focus on the screen, or it prompts you that your eyes are now in the correct position. And if you wondered whether you can wear a hat with it, well, yes you can. I doubt a baseball or snapback will work, but a beanie or woolly hat is absolutely fine. I've had no issues with comfort, even after hours of gaming. And with the different adjustments means it fits snug on my head and doesn't feel like it's going to fall off or apply unnecessary pressure. This helps with reducing headaches and fatigue, so overall it's a nice headset to wear. I also wanted to quickly go over some of the settings. So if you press the PlayStation icon on the controller, you get this quick settings menu. In here, you can adjust the screen brightness, size, and turn the vibrations on or off. You can also quickly set the play area, adjust the visibility, or enable eye tracking. Or you can go into the main settings area, and then go to accessories, and then under PlayStation VR 2, you'll see the entire list of options. The only settings that I've changed so far have been decreasing the boundary display sensitivity to low, and this is where the virtual wall shows up as you're moving around your room. And I've also disabled the tracking support option. I've not had any issues with the tracking, and it means the big black box around the image is removed from the TV or monitor while I'm sharing my screen. Other than that, this is a simple plug and play headset. So the ultimate question is, is the PSVR 2 worth buying? Well, for me, the short answer is yes. Even at the price tag of $550 or £530, it feels well made, it integrates nicely with the PlayStation 5, and the launch lineup of games are decent. And the experience that you get from some of these games are incredible. But for that kind of money, you need to know you're going to make the most of this. It cannot be an accessory that just sits in the box and only comes out a few times a year. So it will come down to whether you see value in it. Do you want to play Horizon Call of the Mountain or GT7 in VR? And do you like the idea of exploring games and worlds in a whole new way? My advice would be to look around at the games that are either out already or that are due to come out over the next six months, and decide if those are the games that you wish to play. And if you can get hands-on with a VR headset before you buy one, I would definitely go ahead and do that, whether that's in a shop or if a friend has one, because it's a lot of money to spend on a headset that you might not use. Now let me know what you thought about today's review and whether you will be buying a PSVR 2 for yourself and if there are any games that you would recommend playing first.
And if you did enjoy today's video, check out my DualSense Edge video next, as it covers the new Pro Controller for the PS5. And I also wanted to say a massive thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. So Squarespace allows you to create amazing websites and gives you the tools to connect with your audience. You can also generate revenue through gated members-only content. You can manage your members, send emails, and leverage audience through the insights, all in one easy-to-use platform. You could create a community of your own through the commenting system, including replies and likes, as well as publishing blogs and creating a powerful e-commerce site. These third-party tools will allow you to manage inventory, promote products, and even streamline your bookkeeping and accounts. So go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash spawn point to save 10% off your purchase of a website or domain. Well, thank you for watching. Please don't forget to like, sub, and follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Until next time.